September 11, 2001. It's a date the world will never forget, and neither will I. I was 27 years old and sitting at my desk on my second day at my new job when my coworker turned on the TV so we could watch the news unfold. We stared in horror as we tried to comprehend what was happening. I turned to my coworker and said, my dad works in that building. Would it be okay if I went and called my mom? I calmly called my mom to ask if my dad had gone into the city that day. He sometimes worked from home in our family home in Flemington, New Jersey. She said he had gone into the office that day because he had a business luncheon to attend. She hadn't heard of the attacks when I told her and assured me that it was probably a small plane as sometimes they clipped the buildings. She clearly had no idea of the severity of what was happening. She promised that she would call and let me know, but that I shouldn't leave work, so I didn't. About an hour later, my sister called and said we were all to meet at my parents' house and to get there as fast as I could. I never returned to that job, not even a phone call. After jumping in my car, I shakily drove to my parents' house. I clearly remember screaming, crying, and praying to God that my dad was safe and we would hear from him soon. It didn't feel real, and I didn't know how to feel other than I was confused and scared. My sister and brother were already there, along with some of my mom's co-workers. That's when I started to feel a big hole in my stomach, and my heart started to physically ache. We watched the news coverage in a state of shock, gasping aloud helplessly as the buildings fell. I fell asleep from exhaustion that night and woke up at 5 a.m. to my mom in the kitchen making coffee. We went back upstairs together to the guest room. My mom wouldn't sleep in her and my dad's bed. We laid in bed together mother holding daughter. We watched the sun rise in silence as my mom whispered in my ear, he's not coming home, honey. We both started to cry. I just wanted to tell him one more time that he was the best dad I ever could have asked for and I loved him so much. As the others started to wake up, a few of us decided we could not sit around waiting. My sister worked for an advertising company and they mobilized quickly, making over 500 missing flyers for us to hang in the city. I was very surprised that my mom was on board with us journeying into the war zone that was the aftermath. But honestly, I think we were her last hope that her husband was out there waiting for us to find him and bring him home to her. That hour car ride to the parking ride in Newark seemed like eternity. Upon our arrival, my brother and I immediately spotted my dad's car. I burst into tears. He hadn't returned to his car and all of a sudden it was a very real possibility that he was indeed gone. I still remember that feeling like someone punched me in the stomach. This stuff doesn't happen to people like us. It, it, it just we traced his steps into the city via the longest path ride ever. Getting out of the subway, we had no idea where to start. My brother and I taped our dad's missing flyers to our shirts, hoping someone had seen him. I remember stumbling through the streets, feeling like I couldn't breathe. We hung flyers, checked hospitals, made phone calls. We even appeared on Larry King Live, all in desperate hope to find my dad. At one point, a nasty rumor reached us. A man was carried from the 100th floor, burned, but alive. We had hope again. It wasn't true. As we walked up to a firehouse down past St. Vincent's, a gentleman looked at me and then my shirt with my dad's missing flyer attached, and he just started to sob and said, Why, God, why? Walking up to other family members, searching for their loved ones, 
hugging each other, giving words of support, kindness, and love. It was unreal. When movie star Sarah Jessica Parker and some of her friends approached us asking for a flyer to join in the search, any other time I would have been starstruck. To this day, it didn't even faze me. Her husband, Matthew Broderick, he wasn't very amused when my brother excitedly welcomed him with, Hey, Ferris Bueller! Through my tears, I did laugh, I will admit. And I think you guys would have too. We returned to the city the following day to appear on Good Morning America. If my dad was in a hospital or had some type of amnesia, maybe someone might have seen him. We were desperate. And looking back, I think we weren't quite ready, or maybe we didn't know how to accept it. While we were there, we learned of the list of survivors at the armory. We waited in a long line of other family members trying to learn what they could as well. Once we were able to view the list, our hope was again shattered. We spotted a second list. One of body parts found. I don't think I was supposed to see this list, but I grabbed it, and when I saw the words, salt and pepper torso, my dad had salt and pepper hair. I literally lost my footing and fell to the ground. My brother started yelling, and the Red Cross workers were trying desperately to comfort us, but they didn't really know what to do. We got out of there and I collapsed on the sidewalk and sobbed. It was then I realized that my brother and I, we had to get out of there. It was time to go home. Didn't want to leave though, I didn't want to give up. We stopped on the way home at the store. I waited in the car. Gentleman pulled in the spot next to me, got out of the car, looked at me and said, I saw you on TV last night. Did you find your dad? He looked so sad, and we both just started to sob. When we got home, my best friend made me take a Valium. When I wouldn't stop pacing, ironically, it was my mom who made me take another one. It was so hard to feel normal, to not have that pit in my stomach, that feeling of helplessness, of not knowing, of emptiness. On the following Sunday, my family and I went to New York City for a meeting with Marsha McLennan, my dad's company. They had floor plans where everyone's office was and where the plane came in between floors 93 and 99. We knew then he was gone. There was no way he survived the impact. Not in his office on the 100th floor. Once again, that feeling like someone punched me in the stomach returned for yet another gut stinger. The days, weeks, months, and even years following were some of the hardest times I've ever lived through. Not only was my own pain heavy, but seeing my mom so lost and fragile, someone I've only ever known as a strong protector, was a pain I can't even explain. I tried to be strong for my family, but I couldn't quite deal with what was happening. What I do remember, though, was being so touched kindness, by love, by amazing acts that people did for us. There were cards and gifts from all over the world, trees planted, memorials and candlelight vigils. My dad wasn't forgotten. Those who loved him the most were surrounded by love. I do believe with all of my heart that every kind word, every loving gesture helped me on my path to healing. Perhaps they were part of what helped me grow out of this in a positive way. I remember my dad's memorial service. There were over 500 people there, standing room. One of my dad's co-workers got up to speak. He began with, I don't make friends very easily, but Mark Rasweiler was my friend. By the time he was done, there was not a dry eye in the house. I've always looked up to my dad, but after that, I knew I wanted to be more like him than I ever thought. 
I wanted to make people feel the way he did. Like they were the most important person in the world. And what they had to say, it really mattered. He made people feel comfortable. He was easy to be around. He was kind and caring, smart and silly. Family was most important to him, and he loved us too. Somewhere along this journey of healing, I felt my attitude, my beliefs, and my values shift. I've always been a compassionate and empathetic person, but this intensified those feelings. I started really listening to others, putting myself in their shoes, wanting to give back and help my fellow man now more than ever. The silly things that mattered, they were no longer a big deal. The big deal was family, how we treat our worldly brothers and sisters, and that not everything is quite as black and white as the younger me had thought it was. If I hadn't gone through this incredible loss, I'm not sure I would have been able to handle some of the other tragic events that I've endured since then with the grace, the patience, and the tolerance that I have. There was the loss of my baby brother to a fentanyl-laced heroin overdose, or the time when I left my 15-year abusive marriage, moved to a new state, and rebuilt my life while living in a women's shelter for three months with my three children. Well, I wish with all of my might that I never had to go through losing one of the people I love the most. I gratefully accept how the real me surfaced and rose above like a phoenix. I can wholeheartedly say I love who I am and I love me.